Allah Taala negates from Himself in the Quran that He is. Um, okay, before I come to this, also you know in the Hadith it says, "Inna Allah la yinam, wa la yinbaghi lahu an yinam." The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Allah does not sleep," and then he said, "Wa la yinbaghi lahu an yinam." Yinbaghi. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, means it's impossible. It means impossible. This is important to understand the translation of this, because sometimes well, this, my translation is incorrectly. So this hadith would be translated as Allah does not sleep and it's impossible for him to sleep. And likewise, the, in the ayah of the Quran, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself that he shows no injustice. He shows no injustice to his creation. So therefore we must negate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any injustice. But is it sufficient just to negate injustice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. We must affirm the opposite and we must affirm it in its perfection. So therefore we say Allah is not having any injustice to his creation because he is described with justice and his justice is perfect. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as in the Quran is mentioned, that Musa said, that my Lord is not forgetful or errors or forgets. So therefore we must, that my Lord neither errs nor forgets. So therefore we must negate from Allah that he errs, he makes a mistake, or that we must negate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgets, and we must affirm what? The opposite. That his knowledge is, that he's knowledgeable, and that his knowledge is perfect. So this is the second part of that rule. The last part of the rule is that concerning things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has neither, uh, Concerning attributes of Allah that he has neither affirmed nor negated from himself. Like sometimes if you say that I believe Allah is upon his throat. Some of these Eshaites will say that therefore are you placing Allah in a place? This is the argument they'll say. Are you placing Allah in a can, in a place? This is when the argument these Mubtadi'in, these heretics will say. So how do we respond to this? We say we only affirm what Allah has affirmed to himself. And we only negate from Allah what Allah has negated from himself. Is this issue of Allah being in a place or not, is this affirmed in the Quran? Do we find any verse that mentions this? No. Do we find that any uh, hadith saying that the Prophet has affirmed this? No. Do we find anything in the Quran which negates this? No. So we neither affirm nor negate this word to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We neither describe nor negate Allah uh, 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 by this either affirming it or negating it. But now we want to investigate into your meaning. What do you mean by this, is Allah in a place? If you mean by this to deny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne, then therefore we say no, Allah is above his throne. And if you mean by this that Allah is not in a place, by meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not occupy part of his creation, whether in the sky or on earth or something like that, then we say yes, this is the true meaning. Allah is above his creation and not mixed with his creation. So the point is in those qualities or those descriptions of Allah which are neither mentioned in the Quran so we neither affirm nor negate that wording and then we investigate that meaning. If that meaning is true, we affirm it. And if that meaning is false, we negate it. But the wording we neither describe Allah negating it nor affirming that. Wording. Okay? Let me try to think of another example. Maybe it'll come back to me. Okay, so the point is is that Ahl al Jama'ah are who? They are those who have adhered to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu have gathered, assembled themselves upon that sunnah, and they have gathered upon the understanding of the earliest Muslims, and they have gathered upon the lawful rulers of this ummah, not revolting against them, whether they're pious or impious. And likewise, among their principles concerning faith in Allah's names and attributes, that they affirm whatever Allah or His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have affirmed for Allah, without tahrif, with either corrupting that by wording or meaning, without negating that, ta'afif, without taqif, explaining how, saying how these names and attributes are, and without tamsir, which means without likening either the creation with Allah or Allah with his creation. And likewise, they negate from Allah whatever Allah has negated, or his Prophet has negated from him, and at the same time affirming its opposite. And concerning those matters which either, which either Allah or the Prophet has not spoken about, those descriptions of Allah, that are neither you find the Quran affirming nor negating it, or the Sunnah affirming nor negating those descriptions, they neither affirm nor negate those words to Allah. 
But rather they investigate into meaning. If that meaning is a true meaning, they accept it. But if it's a false meaning, they, they reject it. And at the same time, they do not describe Allah by those words. This is their faith concerning Allah's names and attributes. In order to understand his faith, that rule, you have to understand what I explained earlier. What I mentioned earlier concerning the way of Ahlul Jamal in the sense that how that Allah sent the Prophet with guidance and how the Prophet explained that guidance clearly and how the companions took that and delivered it. You see, to us, Ahlul Sunnah Jamal. Because if you have doubts concerning that, if you feel that either Allah left this matter unexplained or whether the Prophet did not explain this matter or the companions didn't explain this matter, and therefore, there's no way to affirm our faith, which we've taken from the Sunnah, to be correct or not. But rather we say, this is how it has been handed to us, and therefore this is what we're upon. And the other group have deviated from this faith, and we'll now discuss uh, these deviant groups, uh, you know, and some of their arguments, and refute them, as, or, as Ibn Kamiya mentioned uh, briefly. Are there any questions concerning what I just mentioned uh, for a moment? Oh. A brief question, so you have a lot of material to take. So. How can you simply uh, <coughs> await to us the last? Quite sure. Okay. Now, we have mentioned, we've explained now, the way of Ahlusun al Jama'ah. The term Ahlusun al Jama'ah has two connotations to it. And we have to understand these two connotations to it. Two meanings to it. There is a general sense when we say Ahlusun al Jama'ah. And that means that the person is not a Shi'i. You say he's a Sunni brother, yes, he's not a Shi'i. Even in the newspapers, you know, when they describe certain Muslim countries or certain Muslim uh, rulers or or rulers of Muslims, not necessarily they're Muslim rulers, but rulers of Muslims, or certain Muslim governments, they, they call them either Sunni or Shia. This is a general sense. And this is the sense when Ibn Taymiyyah wrote his book, he called it Minhaj Sunnah and Nabawiyah. In this sense, Sunnah doesn't mean, it means in general sense, it means you're not Shia. And in this sense, it enters the term, term Ahl Jama'ah, the Ash'ari, and the Maturudiyya, and the Sufis, and the, some of the Khawarij, you know, who do not revile, and some of the Mu'tizida who do not revile and insult the Prophet's companions, in this sense. Okay. The other sense, the specific sense of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah means those who adhere to the faith of the Prophet and companions and their practice. And in this we mean, in the second meaning, we mean whom? Ahl Hadith. Ahlul Hadith. And that is why when the scholars of Islam, like Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Al-Bukhari and others, were asked concerning the identity of the saved group, the saved uh, sect when the Ummah were divided into 73 groups, and the victorious group, when the Prophet said there will always remain one group of my Ummah upon the truth, victorious, unharmed by those who quit them, abandon them, who don't want to be part of them, or those who go against them, and they will remain such until the day of judgment, they both described, and other scholars have said that this group and this saved group in the hereafter are the Ahlul Hadith. This is a specific sense of Ahlul Sunnah. The Ahlul Hadith, or what we call in contemporary times as uh, uh, the Salafiyun, and so forth and so on. This is a specific sense. In the general sense, Ahlul Sunnah means what? Those who are not Shia. And this is what most people understand. I mean, most common Muslims, and even the Christians, if you say, okay, he's Sunni, he's not Shia, and so forth in this sense. What are we talking now about Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah? We mean in a specific sense, meaning that they are from Ahl Hadith. And this is the faith which we're talking about. The Ash Hadith are a group which is a, you might say, a bastard method. They have taken some principles from the Sunnah and some principles from the enemies of the people of Sunnah. And they've mixed it all together and they come up with this method called Ash'ariyah. And they claim to be Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. In the general sense they are Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah, in the sense that they're not Shia. But that's not the, that's not the praiseworthy sense. We're talking about in a specific sense. They're not Ahl Hadith. And that is why, because among things, their faith concerning Allah's names and attributes is not the same as the faith of Ahl Hadith. 
And that's why they fought against Ibn Taymiyyah. And that's why they fight against the people of Sunnah throughout the centuries and the ages and their faces. When they describe their faith, they say the way of the Salaf is Aslam, Tariqat al Salaf Aslam, wa Tariqat al Khalaf A'lam wa Ahkam. They say that the way of the Salaf is more sound, and the way of the Khalaf is wiser and more knowledgeable. What do they mean by this? The Salaf, of course, we, is an agreement, we mean the earliest generations of the Muslims, we mean the Prophet Sallallahu companions, and the second and third generation. They say their way is excellent, because they say that they didn't uh, practice, you know, the Ash'aris, um, I should mention before, explaining this, the Ash'aris, when they come to those names and attributes of Allah, like saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they find the Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Allah comes down during the last third of the night to the heaven which is above the earth, and says, who uh, is it who is seeking forgiveness so I may forgive him? Who is uh, asking me so I may give it to him? Whatever he's asking and so forth. Who is asking me forgiveness so I may forgive him? Who is praying to me so I may respond to his prayer? Who wants something for me so I may give it to him? They say Allah didn't come down. Even though the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is reported by more than 28 of the Prophet's companions that Allah comes down during the last night, they say no, it's not Allah that comes down. It's his command that comes down. Or what if his angels come down? So here they're making an allegorical interpretation, which is ta'wil, they call. They call it ta'wil, which we said is tahri. It's really deviation uh, from, and perversion, and corrupting the, the verses of, and, of the, the Qur'an and the words of the Prophet And likewise, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that he has two hands in the Qur'an, and he says that to Iblis, why is it that you have refused to prostrate by him, uh, prostrate to him who I've created with my two hands? Meaning Adam. Allah created Adam with his two hands. So he tells Iblis, after Iblis refused to prostrate, because Allah told the order to the angels and to Iblis, who was from the jinns, to prostrate to Adam, Iblis refused. So Allah said to him, why is it you refuse to prostrate to whom I created my two hands? They say, oh, two hands of Allah means his power and his generosity. So they make ta'weel. This ta'weel is not really ta'weel. This is not interpretation. They're not making tafsir of the Quran. They're making tahrif. But they try to call it ta'wil just to make it sort of slide by the people, you know. And this is tahrif. So the Ash'aris who practice this, they say that the way of the salaf, they've made this rule, and this rule is falsehood. They say the way of the salaf is excellent. Why is it excellent? Because they say the salaf didn't engage in the ta'wil. I mean, you can now not find any statement about Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali or Aisha or Talha or Zubair or from the second generation, third generation saying that Allah's two hands means his power and his uh, generosity. Or saying that Allah's coming down the third night, during the last third of the night, means that Allah's command or his angel comes down. There's nothing to, uh, to support this, trans, uh, this type of explanation, interpretation. So therefore they say their way is safer, because they didn't say anything, so it's best not to say anything. But they say our way, the khalaf, is wiser and more knowledgeable. A'lam al ahkam and this is exactly what the hypocrite said. The hypocrite in the Quran said in Surah Al-Baqarah, they said, are you going to believe like the foolish one believe? Are you going to believe like the foolish believe? Now obviously we're not saying now that the Ash'aris are like the Jews, the hypocrites who, who said that. But I'm saying that the, this type of mentality is derived from the same, from hypocrisy. That here they're saying that we have a knowledge, we are a'lam and ahkam. We're more knowledgeable and more wise than those, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. But this is a really a very, I mean, I mean, monstrous statement to say. I mean, for somebody to claim that. So they say they have to give that explanation, which I mentioned to you before. They said, well, no, they purposely didn't want to explain what it was. Because had they, you know, they were busy doing jihad. They didn't have time to sit and teach the people the Lord's as well. Or they, they make the argument that they knew, but they were silent because if they were to tell the people that, the, the common, you know, Arab in the desert wouldn't be able to understand that and he would end up disbelieving. So therefore, we had to sort of, they had to sort of just stay silent about it. So is it, is it reasonable that they would teach the people the Prophet ﷺ's guidance concerning eating and drinking and defecating and remain silent? They didn't have time to explain to people concerning faith in Allah and His names and His attributes? That is obviously an impossibility. So the point is that the Khalaf, the Ash'aris, they have this false uh, rule they have set up is falsehood 
that they say the method of the Khalaf is more knowledgeable and more wise than the method of the Salaf. We say that the way of the Salaf, the way of the Prophet and his companions is extra, it is safer for you to hear after, it is a'lam, it's more knowledgeable, and it's ahkam, it is more wise. And the way of the Khalaf is the way going to the hellfire, and is the way it's ajhal, more stupid, and it's asfa, more silly, than the way of the, uh, than the, way of the salaf. Mm-hmm. So, the point is, is that, oh, but the point is, how can we prove the way of the salaf is, I mean, more knowledgeable and more wise than the way of the khalaf? We can pr- prove this in a number of ways. And in case for those, maybe I didn't mention the word, salaf means those who came before, and khalaf means those who came after. Uh, literally. But salaf in this sense means the Prophet and his companions, in the second and third generation, the Khalaf means all those who came after them. Those who follow them, though, the first three generations are called Salafi. The, the E sound over here means that they follow the way of the Salaf. And those who do not follow them and follow any of the other paths, uh, 72 sects, are called Khalaf. And they're known as Khalafi because they follow the way of the people who came afterwards. So, first of all, uh, if we look at the, the method of the Salaf, the way of the Salaf, whether concerning this topic or any other topic, we find that their way is, as we mentioned before, they affirm what Allah has affirmed in the Qur'an, and they negate what Allah has negated in the Qur'an. And they affirm what Allah has affirmed in this, in this I mean, they affirm what the Prophet has affirmed for Allah in the Sunnah, and they negate from Allah, subhanahu uh, what the Prophet has negated from Allah. And concerning that, which neither Allah has mentioned, nor the Prophet has mentioned, they remain silent about. So this is true knowledge. Because Allah's revelation is knowledge, and Allah's revelation is the wisdom. So by them only affirming what Allah has affirmed, or His Prophet has affirmed, or and then by negating only what Allah has negated, and what the Prophet has negated, and staying silent concerning that which the, the revelation has not spoken about, that is the true knowledge and that is the true wisdom. There can be no knowledge outside of the revelation, nor can there be wisdom outside the revelation. So this is the first way to refute that. Also, we may refute it by saying to the people who say this rule that, look, either the truth is what the Salaf has said, or the truth is what the Khalaf has said. See, there are two different uh, methods now. See what I'm saying? I mean, if you go to these Ash'ari Imams, you know, who live today, and you say, is Allah upon his throne? They say, no, Allah has conquered his throne. And if you go to the Salafi Imams, or the Imams of Ahl al-Jama'ah in the second sense, in the, in the Ahl al-Hadith sense, and you ask them, is Allah upon his throne? They say, yes, Allah is upon his throne, because he said so in the book. So either one is truth and one is falsehood, because they're negating. I mean, these statements are, there's no way you can reconcile them, okay? So, is it possible that the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the way of his companion is the way of falsehood? That's an impossibility, because they have no way to affirm, to show us that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or his companions or the second or third generation explained Allah being on his throne as he conquered his throne. And that's why they said the way of the Salaf is safer. By their own admission. You see, by their own admission they said that, because there is no way for them to, they have no evidence to interpret that. And as I mentioned before, when Ibn Taymiyyah responded to this question asked to him, and they brought him for the Inquisition, and the debate, and they brought all these Ash'ari, you know, uh, scholars, and they even, they even brought this guy from India, you know, as their final, you know, Forth, and they, he came and he sat on the third day of the, uh, the trial and so forth and they figured he was going to, you know, wipe out Ibn Taymiyyah and so forth. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, fine, listen, I give you seven years or three years, I'm not, I don't remember now, uh, to, you know, show me. He said, I, from, I, you know, neither from the first, not three generations, first three centuries of Islam, bring me a single statement by anybody, whether he was from Ahl Hadith, whether he was a Hanbali, Shafi, a Maliki, a Hanafi, he said even Sufi, he said even the early Ash'ari, the early Ash'ari, to show that they had this type of faith which you proceed to. And the challenge was there, and now seven centuries have passed and they are not able to, to respond to this challenge. Because they themselves have recognized that the way of the Salaf is sounder because they did not delve into these types of allegorical interpretations. So therefore, if since these two methods are mutually contradictory, and there's no way to reconcile it. One has to be truth and one has to be falsehood. As Allah says in the Quran, فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ What is, فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ What is after the truth except for falsehood? So, 
which is going to be the true way? The way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the way of his companions, or the way of these people who come three, four, five, six centuries after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Obviously, the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the way of truth. And so, therefore, these are two ways we can um, show that the way of the Salaf is not only sounder, but it's also more knowledgeable and more wiser, unlike the Ash'aris who claim that the way of the Salaf is sounder, but the way of the Khalaf is more knowledgeable and more wiser. Now, another problem comes is that in their identification of the Medhab of the Salaf, you know, if you ask the Ash'aris, you know, they say the way, the way of the Salaf is more sound. What is the way of the Salaf? They do not know themselves what the way of the Salaf is. They think that the way of the Salaf is to read the verses in the Quran and Sunnah and not understand anything of these meanings, which they call is tafwil, which is tafwil. And this itself is a bid'ah worse and more dangerous than the bid'ah of allegorically interpreting uh, those names and attributes. Because what they say is that when you come to the verse in the Quran, like in Surah Al-Fajr, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًا صَفًا This verse is about the day of judgment. Allah will come to judge the creation. This is affirming an attribute to Allah that He comes and the angels will be with Him and the angels will be in rows, uh, row by row. They don't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. According to their way, they say our way is more wise and more uh, knowledgeable, they say Allah's command comes. Okay? And what is the way of the setup? They say the way of the setup is just to read this verse and not understand anything behind it. Not to understand any meaning concerning it. And this is known as tafwiyab. Tafwiyab means, uh, literally in the Arabic language, in English, we might say the word tafwiyab. Let's see how, yeah. Tafwiyab means to submit something to the judgment of another person. You know, to submit a matter to the judgment of somebody else. They said, the setup they, they didn't delve into this. They just said, okay, only Allah knows the meaning of this, and they didn't understand anything. So therefore, in their estimation, these verses, like that Allah is upon his throne, or that Allah has a face, or Allah has two hands, or that Allah is merciful, or that Allah becomes angered, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees or hears, they say the Salaf understood these verses just like the verse al Islam means, which starts with the Baqarah. al Islam means, what does it, these three detached letters mean? No one knows. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So they think that the Salaf understood these verses in the Qur'an of the same meaning. And this is known as Tafwil. And this is a bid'ah, as Ibn Taymiyyah says, which is worse, an innovation, a heresy, which is worse than to, to allegorically interpret that. Because what you're saying now, the Salaf were ignorant. They didn't understand what they were reading. Is it possible now to imagine that Allah sent this Qur'an as a guidance to mankind, and yet the verses in it, nobody understands the meaning of which? And it becomes a riddle, a puzzle. That's what they're saying. That the Quran is a puzzle. Nobody can understand the meaning of what you. And that's why they said that they think it's better not to interpret anything because since they didn't explain it themselves, it's excellent not to interpret it. But our way, we figured out what the interpretation is. So our way is wiser and more knowledgeable. So that they've made two errors here. They've made the error first of that they think that their way is more wiser and more knowledgeable. Ahkam wa alam. And likewise, they made the second error by they've taken this idiotic belief of just reading the verses and not understanding anything of the meaning, and they have attributed to the Salaf. So they're wrong on both counts. But rather, the Salaf understood what these verses and, and what these statements of the Prophet Sallallahu meant. And they understood according to the literal Arabic language, knowing that Allah has nothing like him, nothing resembles Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why, if you look at the Quran, those verses would say, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ and they ask you you find it that they're always concerning matters of ibadah, worship or matters of dealings with so forth you never find that the companions asking the Prophet ﷺ, what does this attribute mean? what does that attribute mean? but yet they used to question him concerning the halal and the haram why? because these matters were unclear to them sometimes but those matters were so clear to them that's why they didn't ask the Prophet ﷺ concerning it it was their practice to ask what they did not used to know. And you can see this in the Quran and the Hadith. In the Quran, because Allah says in more than one passage, we ask they ask you, O Muhammad concerning something. Concerning the moon, concerning uh, 
fighting in the, in the uh, months, prohibited months of uh, fighting, the, the sacred months, and so forth and so on, concerning women and their division, uh, you know, and inheritance and so forth, and other matters which is mentioned in the Quran. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ So it was a practice to question. And likewise, if you look at the hadith, we find the Prophet ﷺ's companions asking him. Like when Prophet ﷺ said, all my ummah will enter into paradise except for those who refuse. They didn't say, okay, fine. They said, who would refuse the messenger of Allah? They would ask. And he said, whoever obeys me will enter paradise, and whoever disobeys me has refused. When the Prophet ﷺ identified that this community, his ummah would divide into 73 groups, and that all would go to the hellfire, and only one would be saved. They said, who is that saved group? They would, the practice, to ask the Prophet Sallallahu So, why is it we do not find them asking the Prophet Sallallahu concerning Allah's names and attributes? Obviously, because it's so clear to them. Just like now, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, He mentions the sun and the moon. Is it conceivable now that the companions would say, what does the word sun and what does the word moon mean? And what, uh, what are you referring to here? That's impossible. This is their language. And likewise, those names and attributes of Allah and the correct faith of them was so clear to them, they didn't need to ask the Prophet Sallallahu concerning that. But rather, they believed in it literally. And this is why Imam Malik, you know, Imam Malik dies in the year 179. I think it's not Imam Malik died in the year 179 after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Hijrah. One day he was sitting in his circle, and a man came to him and said to him, I think it's not and said to him, Allah has said that he's upon his throne. How is he upon his throne? He's kept ye, one of the things which you must avoid. Imam Malik became very angry. And sweat started to appear on his forehead. Until he said what? He said, Al istiwa u ma'loom. Allah being on his throne, Al istiwa, is known. We understand the meaning of this. This is something which is understood in the Arabic language. Well, case, how is unknown. How is unknown. What su'al, anhu, is a bid'ah. To ask how is a bid'ah. It's an innovation. It's a heresy. Why? Because this is a matter which you cannot understand by your mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too great for us to, I mean, understand. You know, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you think something like, uh, like bacteria or viruses or how certain organs in the body work or how the blood moves in the body and so on. Some of Allah's creation, some of the, the, the details of it is too great sometimes for even the scientists and the, the greatest minds of mankind to understand how these things are. So how about the creator of the heavens and the earth? The, all we know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what he has told us of himself. So how here is impossible for us to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Just like Allah is too great for us to worship Him and praise Him as He deserves. Do you not know the hadith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He used to say? No. When He used to say, لا أحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك That I cannot praise you as you deserve. You are only to be praised as you have praised yourself because only you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can praise yourself as you deserve. Prophet cannot praise Allah as he deserves. And there, Prophet also explained that in heaven, there are angels, and every single hand stands. Some are standing, some are bowing, and some are prostrating. Since the time of the creation until the day of judgment. This is all they're doing, either standing, or, or bowing, or prostrating. And then when the trumpet is blown, and the judgment will come, they'll say, Oh Allah, we have not worshipped you as you deserved. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too great to be worshipped, as he deserves, too great to be praised as he deserves, and too great to be known and to be encompassed by our minds as he deserves. So that's why he said to ask, to question concerning how is, is a bid'ah. And, and what Iman will be he wise, that to believe that Allah is upon his throne is required because Allah has told us in the book. So the point is now, I know what the brothers think they want to make a for Salat al Asaf, that this principle that they have this rule they have set up, these Ash'aris, that the way of the Salaf is sounder and the way of the Khalaf is wiser and more knowledgeable is a false rule. Two ways. We know this from two things, ways. That first of all, they have described themselves with knowledge and wisdom. And that's a false put. But rather, the Salaf are more knowledgeable and more wiser than them. And second of all, they have failed to identify the method of the Salaf. They think the method of the Salaf is to come to these names and attributes of Allah mentioned in the Qur'an and mentioned in the Sunnah and read them literally not understand any meaning behind it. Just like you come to Alif Lam Meem, Alif Lam Ra, Ha, Ka, Ha, Ya, Ain, Saad these detached letters that start off certain surahs only Allah knows the meaning of this, there's no meaning to this and they say therefore these verses are of that, the same thing and that's false. 
but rather we understand them literally, as mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah, affirming the literal Arabic meanings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a manner which He deserves, and knowing that Allah does not resemble His creation, and this is the correct way, and knowing that how is something which our minds cannot encompass, and therefore we do not delve into. So this is in summary that uh, uh, segment, inshallah ta'ala, and let the brothers uh, make a that. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد so, continuing uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, then I'll leave some time for questions. Uh, we have seen in, in these lectures on al aqid al hamawiyah that we have established a way for understanding faith in Allah's names and His attributes. We have shown that this is the most important issue of revelation of Iman, of faith. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained it in this book. And that the Prophet ﷺ has then conveyed this to his companions. And that the companions then conveyed it to us. And that we, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, have received this understanding from them, pure and unchanged. And that by Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we mean Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in the specific sense and not the general sense. Because in the general sense, it means whoever is not a Shi'i. And therefore, in the general sense, it includes people who are like the Ash'aris and so forth. But in a specific sense, it means those who are Ahlul Hadith, or those who are the Salafis, as we say in modern usage. And that their faith in Allah and His names and His attributes and His actions can be summarized in this principle, which we divide into three parts. That they affirm for Allah what Allah has affirmed for Himself, or what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has affirmed for him and that they do this in a manner which has no tahrif and we say tahrif means to either change the wording or the meanings of a text in the Quran and Sunnah or ta'aqeed which we said means to negate something in the Quran or the Sunnah or taqeef which means to explain how Allah's attributes are whether mentioned by way of Quran or Sunnah or tamseed which means to liken Allah to his creation or to liken Allah's creation to him and that tamthil also is sometimes uh, described as tashbih even though the word tamthil is more accurate description than tashbih and we also showed that the Ash'aris claim that they are from Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah or they claim that they are the Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah and that they have erred in this faith concerning Allah his names and his attributes and actions and they come up with a rule which is a false put to it. They say that the way of the Salaf is Aslam, more sound, more safe, but the way of the Khalaf is A'lam and Ahkam, is more knowledgeable and more wise. And also they, when it comes to understanding what is the way of the Salaf, what is the method of the Salaf, they don't know. They say that the Salaf just read those verses in the Quran that mentions Allah's names and attributes and actions or those hadith they received from the Prophet ﷺ, his statements in where the Prophet ﷺ describes Allah and mentions his names, his attributes and actions without understanding any meaning to them. That it's just empty words with no meaning. Just like you might say, Alif Lam These three letters in the Quran are detached letters and therefore they have no meaning to them that we know of. Alif is a letter in the Arabic language. Lam is a letter in the Arabic language. Neem is a letter in the Arabic language. And here they've been detached. They're not composing a word together. They're not all joined together meaning, making a word. So, alif, lam, neem. What does this mean? Only Allah knows. They say that those verses which mention Allah's names and attributes and actions and those hadith of the Prophet his statements 
which describe Allah and mention His names and His attributes and His actions. That the way the setup was that they used to consider these verses of equal nature to verses like Alif Lam Mim. That they were just empty words having no meaning. They say this is the way the setup. They say this is the safer way. And then we refuted that in a number of uh, manners, uh, another a number of ways. One of the ways we refuted was that we said that. If it's to be, if by your own recognition, they said the way of the salaf is safer. And the safe way always is the way of knowledge and wisdom. But here's a contradiction. How could the way of the khalaf be more knowledgeable and more wise if it's not the safer way? That's a contradiction of terms. <coughs> Likewise, we said that the way of the salaf, by their own admission, is the safer way. So why haven't they adhered to it? And that their statement resembles almost the statement of those hypocrites in Surah Al-Baqarah who have said, will we believe or shall we believe like the Sufaha, the foolish have believed? In other words, they have the knowledgeable and the wise way and the other way is not knowledgeable, not wise, of course, a foolish way. And therefore, their statement resembles that, even though they were not saying that they were hypocrites or that they are Jews or anything like that, but we're saying that their belief is drawn from the same uh, root. Same misconception. And likewise, we have shown that that the way of the Salaf is an agreement of the Quran and the Sunnah. For the Salaf have taken the religion from the Prophet Wasallam, as Allah has revealed to them by their own admission. Because they cannot show us anywhere where Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, any of the Sahaba, any of the second generation, any of the third generation, allegorically interpret these names and attributes of Allah, where they mention the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's why when they brought Ibn Taymiyyah for the Inquisition, he challenged them. So I give you three years or five or seven years to bring me any statement, not in the first three generations, but from the first three centuries of Islam. Whether it was written by a person from Ahl Hadith, or a person who was a Hanbali, or a Shafi, or a Maliki, or a Hanafi, or a Sufi or even an Ash'ari, because the earlier Ash'aris did not adhere to the Ash'ari method as it is now. Show me once where they interpret this and I will collapse, just change my method and accept what you say. And the challenge has not been responded to and now seven centuries have passed and it will never be responded to until the Day of Judgment because this is an impossibility by their own admission. So now we're going to come, now that we set these rules and uh, these of principles, and we've shown how they have misunderstood what the method of the setup is, and they've now, and they've also claimed that their method is more knowledgeable and wiser. But the method of the setup, we said, is to affirm what Allah has affirmed for Himself, without tahrif, without changing the meaning, or uh, or the wording, without ta'afir, without denial of the meaning, without tahrif, without saying how, without tamsi, without likening Allah to His creation or likening His creation to Him and to negate from Allah what he has negated from himself and at the same time affirming the opposite in a manner of perfection to Allah and that which the Quran is silent about they neither affirm nor negate but rather they investigate the meaning if that meaning is the true meaning they affirm the meaning only not the wording because it's not mentioned in the Quran Sunnah and if it's a false meaning they negate therefore the meaning if this is the way of the Salaf and it's the safer way it's the more knowledgeable way and it is the wiser way and they have misunderstood the way of the Salaf by thinking it's just to read these verses and read these hadith and not understand anything behind them. And likewise, they claim that their way, which is to allegorically interpret these verses and these hadith, is the wiser and more knowledgeable way. So now we're going to come to actually um, some of the statements of the Salaf. And among the statements of the Salaf, uh, which point to this is the statement of Imam Malik, which I mentioned. Where Imam Malik was one time questioned by a man, he said, Oh, uh, Abu Abdullah, which was the kunya of Imam Malik, Ar-Rahman wa ala al-Arsh istawa. Allah is upon his throne, as is above his throne. How? Kayf istawa. Imam Malik became very angered, and his forehead became uh, filled with sweat. And the reason why is, you might imagine, is because to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a false manner is not something simple. It's not something simple. The Christians who tomorrow when they wear their best clothes, their best garments, and they put on their best scents, and they go out to their churches, 
thinking that they're praising Allah. They're actually saying a statement, which when the, this word is said, the heavens, the sky wants to rent asunder, wants to split, and the mountains want to collapse. Why? Because they say Allah has a son. See how the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those great mountains, the great size and of those mountains, it wants to crumble because this is such a horrible statement. And that's why in the Qudsi hadith reported in Bukhari and elsewhere, Allah says, the son of Adam insults me. And it's not for him to insult me. And the son of Adam belies me. And it's not for him that. As for his insulting me, he says, I have a son. And I am an Ahad, a Samad. And I have not given birth nor was I born, and there is none like me. And as far as his uh, belying me, he says that I cannot bring him back to life after his death. Resurrect him again. And to bring back the creation a second time is easier than to create them the first time. So this great state, this statement of insulting the law, look how the creation acts towards this. The sky wants to rip apart the heavens, and the mountains want to collapse because they said Allah has a son. And that's why the companions of the Prophet used to say, show them no mercy. Show them no mercy. I mean the Christians. For they have insulted with Allah in a way that none of his creation has insulted him. And this doesn't mean that they told him to be uh, cheating them or deceitful toward them or to... Um, take from them the rights which Allah has accorded them, that's forbidden in Islam. Rather, we must give them the rights which Allah has accorded them. And we cannot therefore cheat them or lie to them and, you know, rip them off and so forth and so on. This is forbidden in our religion. We're not like Jews, you know. The Jews, they have a set of rules for the people in their community and a set of rules for the people outside of their community. No. Rather, we accord to the people the rights which Allah has accorded for them. However, though, that's one thing to give them the rights which Allah has accorded to them. That's one thing to show mercy in one's heart and love in one's heart towards them. Two different things. Two different things. And likewise, Imam Malik, when this man came with this statement, came into the message of the Prophet Sallallahu And we know Imam Malik died in year 179 after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's still within the first, it's in the third generation after the Prophet Sallallahu And he said, to Imam Malik. How is Allah upon his throne? Imam Malik became very angered. He is reacting like how we should react when we hear people speak about Allah or about his religion or about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from their ignorance and make up things, you know, uh, making up uh, ways to describe Allah and his religion and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not like as people imagine. Everybody has his own religion in his pocket. He just pulls it out whenever he wants, and he says, I think Islam is such and such and such and such, and puts it back when he wants it to. This is not Islam. Islam, as we mentioned, the first thing is what Allah came, uh, sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with. So Imam Malik became angry, and he said, Al-Istiwa'u Ma'loom. That Istiwa, in Arabic, is understood. You speak Arabic, I speak Arabic. We know what the word Istiwa means. It means that he's above, and his throne, that he's settled upon his throne. Well, kaifu, how is majhul? How Allah's upon his throne is unknown to us. Why? Because this is something which is beyond our minds. As Allah in the Quran says, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِهِ عِلْمًا That you do not encompass him in, a knowledge, in, in knowledge. Allah is too great for us to, un, to, to, um, to encompass with our minds. Or to fancy with our hearts. What do we know of Allah is what Allah has revealed to us in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And also Allah is too great that we may praise Him as He deserves. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ in the Dua which is mentioned in Wichab, that, O oh Allah, You are as You have praised Yourself. O oh Allah, I cannot praise You as You deserve. You are as You have praised Yourself. Because Allah is too great. No matter how much You praise Allah, no matter what You say from the ways of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot praise Allah as He deserves. And likewise, worshipping Allah. You cannot worship Allah as He deserves. That's why those angels who have been since the beginning of the creation to the Day of Judgment, there's not a hand span in the heaven. Except there's an angel standing, bowing, or prostrating. This is all they do. And yet, when the 
pump it is blown on the Day of Judgment? What will they say? Oh Allah, we have not worshipped you as you deserve. We have not worshipped you as you deserve. So Allah is too great for us to imagine by our mind, or to fancy by our hearts, or to praise by our tongues, or to worship by our limbs. He's too great. Too great. And therefore, what we know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what He has revealed to us in the Quran or the Sunnah. And this is the meaning of Imam Malik's statement, Well, kayfu majhul. It's unknown to us. Because if you're going to make an analogy, an analogy of something with something. For instance, I want to now compare this with that. These two recorders in front of me. In order for me to do this comparison, I must have one of three ways of knowledge. Either I must know that these two things are equal, they're the same. So I, therefore, if I've seen one, I can compare it to another. And Allah, there's nothing like Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kemithi he said. Or I must have seen the other one to compare the two together. So I can make a comparison. And who has seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is the meaning of Imam Malik's statement with Kayfu Machul. It's unknown to us. Allah has not revealed it to us and therefore we cannot mention it. And then what did he say? He said, with tu'alu anhu bid'ah. To ask this is a bid'ah, it's a heresy. It's something which is an innovation, something wicked. Neither the Prophet's companions nor those who took Islam from the Prophet's companions asked concerning these matters. How is this? How is that? But rather they believed it, it literally. Allah described himself like that and they accepted it. Because they knew that the how was something that their minds couldn't reach. And they knew that Allah hasn't explained to us how, so therefore why would they delve into this? This is something beyond them. They're glass. So why do you now in the third generation want to ask this question? Why do you want to now ask how? And then he said what iman will be he wajib. That to accept this iman, faith, to believe that Allah is about the sword is wajib. It's something required. Why? Because it's mentioned in the Quran. Another statement of the Salaf which shows that that their madhab, how their madhab was, is the statement of Al-Khuzai. Al-Khuzai was one of the um, shaykhs, one of the scholars of Imam al-Bukhari, the author of al-Sahih. Al-Khuzai says what? He says that to deny what Allah or the Prophet ﷺ has described Allah with, to deny what Allah has described himself with or what the Prophet ﷺ has described Allah with, it's kufa, it's disbelief. Because if Allah has said it, it's required for us to believe it. And if the Prophet has said it, it's required for us to believe it. And likewise, he said to liken Allah with his creation. Or it's also disbelief. And then he said, in, in what Allah or his Prophet, in what Allah has described himself with or what his Prophet وسلم, has described Allah with, there is no resembling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Resemblance to Allah. Because the one who reveals the verse, Laysa kemithlihi shay, there is none like him, is the same one who reveals the verse that he has a face and two hands. And it's the same one who reveals to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that he descends during the last third of the night to the lowest heaven. So therefore, in that, by affirming what Allah has affirmed for Himself, or affirming what the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed for Allah, there is no resemblance to Allah, resembling the, Allah to His creation in that and whatsoever. Because all these descriptions come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah is more knowledgeable concerning Himself uh, than we are concerning Him. Indeed, He is more knowledgeable concerning our own selves than we are of our own selves. And that is why we find that the Salaf, like Makhul, who is from the second generation, Az Zuhri, also from the second generation, Malik, who is from the third generation, Sufyan, who is from the third, Al Layf ibn Sa'id from the third, and Al who is from the third generation, all of them had statements where they said concerning those verses and those hadith which mention Allah's names and attributes and actions, to accept them as they are without saying how without saying how. They've all been quoted upon uh, saying that. In other words, affirm the meaning as they are and do not say how. Now, 
here comes a question which sometimes people, you know, they misunderstand the method of the setup. And they say, well, we have been told not to question how. So therefore, sometimes people will say mistakenly, so therefore Allah's attributes will say does not have a how to it. There's not a how to his attributes. That's incorrect. Yes, Allah has risen upon his throne in a manner. What that manner is, we do not know. Allah knows that. See what I'm saying? So the how, Allah knows. But for our, our, uh, in terms of our, in our respect, we do not know that. So we say we cannot say how, because we're ignorant. We do not know that. Allah has revealed that in something which our minds cannot grasp. It's beyond us. So therefore, we're silent about that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how his attributes are and how he is and so forth. Even though we are ignorant of that. Just like paradise now. Okay? We know that in paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that the people will eat and drink. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described to us in the Quran what are some of the types of food and some of the types of drinks that they will have in paradise. May Allah make us from the people of paradise. Allah has said that the people will be eating meat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they'll be eating fruits. And that they will be drinking from rivers. Rivers of water, rivers of honey, rivers of milk, rivers of wine. Now, we understand what meat is, right? And we understand a uh, fowl, you know, a uh, bird. Uh, and we understand what fruits are. And we understand what milk is, and what water is, and what honey is, and what wine is. We understand this, and we accept it literally. Allah says, people in paradise will eat and drink and enjoy these things. How they are in paradise, we don't know. But we know that there will be milk, but the milk will not be like the milk on this earth. Because it's a milk that will not spoil. And we know that there will be wine in paradise for the believers. How that wine is, we do not know. But... We know that it's a wine that will not make you drunk or intoxicated or dizzy. But it's going to be there. And we know what wine means. So in the same sense, Allah's attributes, we believe in them because Allah has mentioned them, but how, we do not know. Because it's something which is beyond our comprehension. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how He is Himself. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how those things will be in paradise. How they, how they are. Because he's created them. And when we are in paradise, we will then know about it because we will then, inshallah ta'ala, may Allah make some people's paradise, we will then see those things and we'll be able to know the how. How it is. But now for us in the dunya, in this world, we cannot understand that. But as far as Allah's attributes, we will not be able to understand that because this is something which is beyond our minds. Allah is just too great. You see what I'm saying? And, and therefore, the how, we cannot say how his attributes are. But we affirm what he has described himself by, and we accept it as true and literal. See, there's a difference between the two. Now, but Allah does have a kafiyah or a how to his attributes, which only he knows. None of the creation knows that. Neither the angels, nor the prophets, nor the rest of uh, mankind. So now we're going to mention uh, some of the attributes of Allah which the Ash'aris often um, negate. That's under We have a... Uh, well, before I go that, let, uh, since we only have 15 minutes, let me entertain some of the questions of the brothers. And in the next session, after, after we break for lunch, I'll mention some of the attributes which they negate. And these are the attributes which usually cause people to have some sort of confusion with, and so forth, like Allah's uh, being upon the throne, and also like... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face and hands and his speech and so forth. Some of the things which often uh, there's some confusion with. And then we'll discuss some of the other issues in the book, inshallah ta'ala. And as I mentioned, that uh, there are other lectures uh, which uh, I, uh, that's why I chose to choose this book, Al-Aqid al hamali because that explains many of Allah's names in, in Colorado and it's on the cassette tape explaining the book of Ibn al-Qayyim uh, concerning Allah's Tawheed. And likewise, Al-Aqid al wasatiyah in London, I explained a lot of the names and attributes of Allah. So therefore, not to be repetitious, I want to, in these lectures, lay down some of the principles so that a person, if he listens to those cassettes and has also listened to these cassettes, he might have a good understanding of the creed of Ahl Sunnah al
so uh, if there's any questions concerning what we dealt with, uh, I'll be glad to uh, uh, answer those, which I know. If we'll see what yes, so the consensus, shall I try to, we'll put Brother Idris Palmer in charge of uh, getting those kids that. So if anybody's angry, just direct anger towards him. <laughs> well, we, I've asked them, we've asked them, inshallah ta'ala. So we sent them, you know, uh, requested from them officially. And inshallah ta'ala, we hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings that. Uh, uh, your question, yes. Okay, well, I forgot what it was. Can you send I'll explain the same thing that, uh, that the Christians have taken the concept that they have uh, given the qualities that man has to a law by saying that he arrested on the seventh day. Uh, Jehovah Witness worked at my job so since they're not a part of a Christian dome. The meaning of the, the statement is that after the seventh day, Allah just said, you know, how wonderful this creation is. He just like ponder over his creation. How can we refute this claim? Yeah, so this is now, they have first attributed a falsehood to Allah. By saying that Allah rested. This is a quality of imperfection. I mean, Allah got tired and he had to rest. So they, this is a problem. So now this person, he wants to now, because he's, instead of accepting now that there's some, some corruption in his revelation, he wants to now make ta'rif of his, of his initial corruption. They added something to the scriptures, and now he wants to interpret it in a manner which is not that, you know, the word rest is very clear. If he wants to say now that the word rest means that Allah looked at his creation and was pleased with what he saw and so forth, this is a tahrif of the, of the meaning of what they've said, you see. So therefore, you have to ask him, what language, you know, spoken by mankind, uh, does the word rest mean this? And there's no language of, of mankind like this. And this is similar, the Christians are very good at this. This is similar to when you say, when as Ibn Taymiyyah shows in his refutation of the Christians of Jawab al-Sahih, when he discusses uh, them, uh, the Trinity, when they say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, they cannot prove the Trinity by revelation, uh, by reason, by reason. They cannot prove, uh, excuse me, they cannot prove the Trinity by reason. Because it makes no sense, you know what I'm saying? So they try to try to establish it by revelation. But in revelation, there's nothing clear for it. So they say that, okay, you Muslims describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as having knowledge and wisdom and um, creation he creates okay so creation Allah's creation is the father and Allah's attribute of creation is the father and Allah's the, the son is his attribute of uh, of, 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 um, of speaking and uh, the Holy Ghost is the attribute of life and so forth so if it says to them okay what language spoken by mankind that you describe uh, that speech is called son or that, you know, knowledge is called Holy Ghost. This is not a single language of mankind, but rather you've thought, you know what I'm saying, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what I'm saying, uh, and may Allah be far removed from this, this statement of falsehood, you know what I'm saying, you know, had, uh, uh, basically what they think, this is what most of the Christians, you know, the, the general folk of the Christians believe, you know, had sex with Mary. This is what most of the general folk of the Christians, you know, imagine in their minds, and that Isa, was born from this, you know what I'm saying? That's what they call Jesus the Mary, the mother of God, and, you know, the father of the son. They think of it in this sense. This is what they believe, most of the uh, Christians. But because of the scholars amongst the Christians, find it to be something which is, I mean, you know, um, um, repulsive. Repulsive. Therefore, they've tried to come with this argument, you see. And therefore, they, they try to say that this means this and so forth and so forth. But this doesn't make any sense according to any language. So the point is, in, in the same sense, with this person is a Jehovah Witness, uh, he's trying to now deny something which is a falsehood in their scriptures, which they have placed in their scriptures, because obviously Allah's speech has no falsehood to it, and then he's trying to now to explain it in a way which doesn't make any sense. Huh? Yeah. No, no. Okay. Any other questions? Translate? It was translated already, but I was wondering it was translated a couple of different times, different editions of the different kind of translation. The Lord of the Worlds were painted in the evening. Okay. 
Okay, this is a hadith which is important to uh, uh, just to uh, mention. I'll read it in English and then we'll come to the point which is. Uh, Okay, so the hadith is the brothers, uh, he took it from Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, from the Kitab al-Isti'idhan, the book of asking permission, that um, that during the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, some people said, oh Allah's apostle or messenger, shall we see Allah on the day of resurrection? The Prophet wasallam said, yes, and you will have no difficulty. Uh, the Prophet wasallam said, yes, and then he asked him, do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun at midday? when it is bright and there are no clouds in the sky. In meaning the sense that just as you see the sun clearly during midday and there are no clouds in the sky, in the same sense you'll see Allah clearly. You'll have no difficulty in seeing Allah. They replied, no, we have no difficulty. Uh, he said, do you have any difficulty in seeing the moon uh, when it's full, on the night when it's full and it's bright and there are no clouds in the sky? They replied, no. The Prophet said, similarly, said, similarly, you will have no difficulty in seeing Allah on the day of resurrection as you have no difficulty in seeing either the sun or the moon. Then the Prophet ﷺ went on to say that on the day of resurrection, it will be announced, somebody will announce, let every nation follow that which they used to worship. Every nation, every community will be asked to follow whoever they worship. Uh, then none of those who used to worship anything besides Allah, like idols and Fahud, other deities, uh, but will fall into hell until there will remain none except those who worshipped Allah alone and were obedient and disobedient and a group of the people of the scripture so what will happen is, is you might imagine the pagan Arabs will go follow their idols to the hellfire and the Buddhists will follow their Buddha to the hellfire and the Confucianists will follow their Confucius idol to the hellfire every single nation will follow their idol to the hellfire and remaining on the sand will be the Muslims, and amongst the Muslims will be the hypocrites from this Ummah, and also whether they're pious or impious, and the people of the scripture. So it will be said to the Jews, uh, some of the Jews, uh, who did you worship? And they would say, we used to worship Isaiah, or Ezra, the son of Allah. And it would be said to them, you are liars, for Allah has neither taken a wife nor a son. And they'll say, what do you want now? They'll say, oh our Lord, we are thirsty, so let us have something to drink. Because the day of judgment is 50,000 years. And the people will be standing during that whole time and they will become thirsty. Um, they will be, uh, then be directed, uh, to, to drink and, uh, they will be shown, taken to the hellfire, which will look to them as a mirage, uh, with different sides destroying each other and they will fall into the hellfire. And this is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will set them astray. Just like He set them astray in this world, they will go to the hellfire, they'll think it's, like okay, a mirage, something cool for them to drink and it'll be the hellfire and they'll fall into it. And likewise the Christians in the same sense. Uh, it will be said to them, who do you worship? They used to say, we worship Jesus, the son of Allah. It will be said to them, you are liars. For Allah has neither taken a wife nor a son. What do you want? They will say, um, uh, what like the Jews said, and they will be then taken to the hellfire. Now, so the people who will remain will be the people of this Ummah who used to worship Allah alone and amongst them will be the obedient and disobedient, the, the, the sinful and the pious. And then Allah will come to them, and this is what the question the brother is asking, uh, He will come to them in a, this translation says, in a shape nearest to the picture they had in their minds about Him. Let's see what the Arabic says. And they'll say, uh, So the point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one hadith says in Sahih Muslim, I believe. Allah will come to them in a, in a, in a shape, in a, they will see Allah, but they will not see Him as He is. They will appear, Allah will appear to them in a way which is as He is not as He is. And therefore, they will say, we seek refuge from you. We will stay here until our Lord comes to us. And then Allah will say to them, how will you recognize your Lord? They'll say, between us and Him there is a sign. What is the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, that, that He will uncover His shin? And when that happens, all the Muslims all will fall down prostrate. As was mentioned in the ayah in uh, Surah uh, um, uh, um, Surah uh, Hanab. Except for the hypocrites. Their backs will become like a rod. And that's because in this world they were called to pray and they used to refuse to pray. So on the day of judgment when they want to 
prostrate, they won't be able to prostrate. And then the believers will go to paradise. So the point here is that concerning this hadith concerning uh, surah, uh, surah. The, uh, this affirms this hadith and the different narrations of it affirms that among Allah's attributes that he has a surah, that he has an image. He has an image. Because the Prophet said that Allah will come to him in a surah, not of his own surah, in his own image. And then he also, the Prophet said another afterwards, he'll come to him in the image which they will recognize. What is Allah's image? Allah's image is an image which befits him. How? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. We do not know. And that this image we affirm it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet affirmed to him without delving into how. Believing it literally. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's image is not like the image of any of his creation. Allah does not look like a man, for instance, or one of his creatures, or one of his creations. But we know, for instance, that Allah's image is what it befits him, so therefore it's the most beautiful image, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the qualities of perfection and all the qualities of beauty, of beauty. Now, as far as the specific thing over, um, over here where it mentions um, that, um, uh, this specific wording of the hadith that when Allah comes to him, he will come, I, what I remember is that he will come to him in an image which they do not recognize. And in this wording of the hadith, he says that he will come to them as translated over here uh, in an image uh, which is nearest to what they had in their minds about him, which they imagined. Uh, this, uh, specifically what this is referring to, uh, and the correct understanding of this, I need to refer to the uh, books of uh, explaining the hadith for that. Like, I don't recollect anything at this time. But the point is, is that uh, the image of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is an attribute, his surah, is something which is uh, affirmed to him by the sunnah, and therefore we must affirm it to Allah, knowing that Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is nothing like him, and that his image we affirm it to him in a manner of perfection and of beauty. And this is one of the things that we, we look forward to in the Day of Judgment, you know, that Allah, that Allah blesses us that we see Him on the Day of Judgment, and we see Him as He is. But what you find now in these books written in English, they say, uh, you know, Allah is uh, imageless, and He's uh, infinite, and so forth. And they, here they're describing Allah by things which He hasn't described Himself by. And we said the way of Anasun Jama'ah is that when it comes to things which are not mentioned, either in the Quran and we neither affirm them nor do we negate them, but we investigate into their meaning. And when we, when we investigate, when they describe Allah as being imageless, as they say, and so forth, we find actually what it is is that they're trying to deny Allah's attributes, like Allah having a face and hands and eyes and so forth, and like this hadith and so forth. So therefore, it's, it entails a false meaning. So that, that's, inshallah, a brief response to that answer. Yes, please. Yes, I don't know if I mentioned going back and forth, but in uh, the part when you had was mentioned that the things that Allah and the Prophet gave up Allah, that we also believe in opposites, are these just to certain attributes? Um, like, for instance, someone might try to say in relation to the opposite of he doesn't sleep nor slumber, he sleeps nor slumbers, nor he, he doesn't beget, nor is he begotten, that he, he begets and he begot the opposite of it. So this justifies a certain attribute. No, no, no. No, you have to, the opposite meaning. You see what I'm saying? So when you say that, for instance, and this is for all the attributes, the idea of, the, you know, the, the idea of Allah's names and attributes is to praise Allah. And for instance, like now, if I say that this wall is not ignorant, it's not ignorant. This is not praise, a thing of praise, because wall is, doesn't have knowledge in the first place. You see what I'm saying? But when you say that, for instance, that this fellow is not ignorant, it's because he's knowledgeable because he has knowledge, you see what I'm saying? So therefore you're affirming the, the opposite of it. If I say that this fellow is not uh, um, ruthless, because he's kind, you're affirming the opposite. But if I say the wall is not ignorant or not ruthless, there's no, there's no praise in that whatsoever. So the opposite has to be. So the opposite has to be. And the, of course, since we're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the opposite is then therefore affirmed to a sense of perfection. Now, so therefore, when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is not born, nor does he give birth, is because he's al-ghari, he's free from all wants. You see what I'm saying? And because he's perfect and he's free from all wants, he has no need to uh, uh, give birth. or And because he's an awwal, because he's the first, and therefore he was not born. He preceded everything, and everything else is his creation. So we form the opposite and imperfection to it, and so forth and so on. So this is with all the attributes. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. 
this is coming down from the higher heaven to the lower heaven. Does this imply that the heat of peace is in the creation? Yeah, I'm going to uh, respond to this. This is one of the one of the uh, uh, things which will come in the book. So, inshallah, wait for the next session. This, this will come up, inshallah. Is there some question? Okay. No, no, no. Okay. No. 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 Yes, brother. Something that I think you're getting, you know, when part of the talk, right? Just as the... Physical appetites of uh, you know, sex, sex drive and the, uh, you know, the desire to eat are uh, all natural drives, but they have to be uh, contained. You know, and there's laws governing it in, in, in uh, you know, that system, right? Uh, is there a similar restraining law governing the, the reason? I mean, yeah. I mean, we have the natural, we have curiosity. I don't know, I'm not going to say how natural it is. Maybe right. it's just the, you know, the urge to try to get to the essence, to penetrate the essence of thing. I don't know if this is your Western uh, you? peculiarity or what, but uh, is there in, 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 in the Quran or in the Hadith, is there something uh, from, from the rules of uh, yes. how far we can go? Absolutely. Absolutely. Understanding. Absolutely. Or, you know, you know, like, eating beyond what you need is wasted, uh, wasted energy. Or uh, sex beyond the natural boundaries is uh, perverse. And so it's reasoning and trying to, you know, you know delve into the these, uh, sure. whatever. Yes, uh, the answer to it is yes. Knowledge is of two types, a useful knowledge and a non-useful knowledge, non-beneficial knowledge. The useful knowledge is that which comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. There are certain things, because we are the creation of Allah, which is beyond us, which we cannot understand. For us to seek knowledge of those matters means there's perversion of the heart. Allah in the Qur'an says, it is he who has sent down the book, among which are ayah verses which are muhkamat, clear, and of no, uh, the interpretation of it is, is, is obvious. And others are mutashabihat, those which are unclear in meaning. As far as those people who have a perversion of the heart, they seek the, these verses and they try to seek its interpretation. Uh, or they try to seek uh, a fitna, you know what I'm saying, but, and also they try to seek its interpretation. And none knows the interpretation of these matters except for Allah. The people who are firmly grounded in knowledge say what? They say this is all from Allah, meaning these verses and these verses. And we believe it. Because all of these verses have been sent down by Allah. Now, these verses concerning the Day of Judgment, and these verses concerning uh, the realities of paradise and hellfire, and these verses concerning Allah and His names and attributes are from Al-Muhkamah, from the clear verses in one sense, and from the Mutashatihat in another sense. They are from the Muhkamah in the sense that we literally knows what, know uh, what it means when Allah says there is a fire which people will be burnt in it. But it's from the Mutashabihat, in the sense, how is that fire? I mean, now if there's a fire in this world, we can, you know, take its temperature, we can say what caused it, so this is we can't understand beyond our reasoning. Likewise, concerning the paradise. The pleasures of paradise, having women, eating, drinking, and so forth, is from the Muhkamah. But the how is from the Mutashabi hat, because it's something beyond our minds. Allah's names and attributes are from the Muhkamah. In the sense that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that He is merciful, we understand what it means to be merciful. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has a face, we understand what this means. But we know that there's nothing like Allah. How is from the Mutashabi. To seek the knowledge which is something which is beyond us, or which the Quran and the Sunnah has not spoken of, is an indication of perversity in the heart. An indication of perversity in the heart. And that's it. And we have to also preserve us from that. Huh? Perversion? <laughs> right, so I think now they want to break uh, because the lunch is here. So inshallah will uh, suffice with this. And inshallah will come back and we'll discuss the rest of the lunch. Is that one? Bismillah. Walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ba'id. So we left off in the uh, creed of Al-Hamawiyah. <coughs> mentioning some of the statements of the Salaf. And the last statement we mentioned was the statement of al khuzai that whoever resembles Allah with his creation has disbelieved, and that whoever negates from Allah what he has resembled, uh, what he has affirmed him, what he has affirmed 
for himself, whether by way of the Quran, Sunnah has disbelief. And then in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed for himself, or the Prophet has affirmed for him, there is not any resemblance uh, to uh, the creation. We now will now uh, begin to discuss some of the attributes which the Ash'aris have problems with and interpret allegorically. And the first attribute which will be discussed is that known, which is known as Sifat al ulu or that attribute which refers to Allah being above his creation. But prior to um, getting into a discussion concerning the, uh, these attributes which the Ash'aris uh, uh, interpret allegorically, I would like to just mention very briefly a few rules concerning the names of uh, uh, belief in Allah's names and attributes. And that is because uh, it's, it's very important to understand this, even though I've explained these in much greater detail elsewhere. And you can refer to those other lectures or writings for a more detailed discussion. Uh, one of the, we mentioned that the rule of Ahasun Jama'a in general is to affirm that Allah has affirmed for himself and to negate what Allah has negated from himself without tahrif or ta'afid or taqif or tafsir. Another rule uh, concerning Allah's names is that we cannot say that Allah's names have a certain number to them. We cannot say that Allah's names have a certain number to them. But rather Allah's names are innumerable. The evidence to this is the statement of the Prophet in his dua. He says, As'aluka I ask you, O oh Allah, by every name which belongs to you, whether you named yourself by that name, or you revealed it in your scripture, or you taught it to one of your creatures, or you've kept that name hidden uh, with you in your knowledge of the unseen. So obviously those names which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept hidden with himself in the knowledge, his knowledge of the unseen, there is no way for us to know. And therefore there is no way for us to enumerate. So we cannot say that Allah has a, only a certain number of names. The idea that many Muslims have that Allah only has 99 names, and they base it upon the hadith where the Prophet said that belonging to Allah are 99 names, whoever ahsaha, or in other words, whoever encompasses them will enter paradise. This does not negate that Allah has more than 99 names. All it means in this hadith is that among the names of Allah are 99. And that whoever enumerates these 99 names, meaning by enumerating them, by, it means that you memorize them and that you worship Allah uh, by them. And you know the, its meanings, uh, you will enter into paradise. But it does not mean that there are only 99 names for Allah. And an example is, for instance, if I was to say that I have prepared a hundred guns for jihad, for instance. It doesn't mean I don't have more guns. This means that of the guns I've had, I prepared a hundred for jihad. And likewise, uh, with Allah's names, He has 99 names. Of those 99, of His names are 99, that whoever memorizes them and knows its meanings and worships Allah by, what, uh, by those names, He will enter into paradise. How is uh, faith in Allah's names completed? Faith in Allah's name is completed in one of two ways. If the masr or the verbal noun from which that name is derived is based upon a transitive uh, verb, which means it takes an object, then faith in that name uh, occurs by believing in the name, its attribute, and what is known as the asr or the hukum in Arabic, its uh, effect. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Allah's name, Ar-Rahim. To believe in that name is to, to believe that among Allah's names is Ar-Rahim, because it's mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah that to believe in the attribute which that name encompasses, which is Rahmah, mercy, and to believe in the Asr, or the Hukum, which means to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful with His creation, and that His mercy has encompassed everything. But if the Masr, the verbal noun of that name, is intransitive in Arabic, it doesn't take an object, then belief in that name only includes in believing it's the name and the attribute which it encompasses. Like to believe in Allah's name, Al-Hayy, it, part, to believe in that is just to believe that Allah has a name, or among his names is Al-Hayy, and that you believe in the attribute which is Hayat, that he has the attribute of life. So he is the ever-living, and he possesses the attribute of life. As far as Allah's uh, attributes, Allah's attributes are basically, uh, you may, in one way, you may divide them into two types. 
those attributes which discuss Allah's essence, they describe Him, and they are inseparable from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're known as Sifat al Zatiyah. As Sifat al Zatiyah. Among which is His attribute of knowledge, sight, hearing. Uh, these attributes are inseparable from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are other attributes which are attributes which describe His actions, like creation, sustaining, and so forth. These attributes occur when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, according to His wisdom and to His will. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates when He will, according to His wisdom and so forth. And therefore, this attribute is not like the attributes of His essence, which are inseparable from Him, like knowledge and hearing and sight and so forth and so on. So mercy, for instance, is an attribute describing one of His actions, in one sense, like in the name Ar-Rahim. And He shows mercy uh, to His creation. And that sense is from the attributes of His actions. He shows mercy to the believers, but He doesn't show mercy to the disbelievers in the Day of Judgment. So it's by his will when who he wants to show mercy to. But as far as uh, the attribute of mercy concerning his name Ar-Rahman, this describes his essence, that by his nature that he is merciful. And so therefore this is inseparable from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, with that brief discussion, as I said, I've discussed those principles and those rules in greater detail in those cassettes uh, in other lectures, like those taped in Colorado and in, uh, in London. However, though, now I'd like to uh, discuss this attribute which the uh, the Ash'aris uh, negate and they allegorically interpret. This is the attribute of Al-Ulu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. This attribute is from Allah's sifat al It describes his essence. And therefore it's inseparable from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah always has this quality of being above his creation. And this attribute is two parts to it. One of it describes his essence in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us. That his essence that he is above us. And another sense in terms of his quality. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us in the sense that he's more powerful than us. And in the sense that he has all the attributes of perfection. Uh, that every single attribute of perfection he possesses it to the fullest. And therefore he has it completely. So in this sense he is uh, above us. And the attribute of Allah being above us in the sense of that he's above us in his essence. Uh, is affirmed by the Book of Allah, is affirmed by the Sunnah of the Prophet it's infer- affirmed by the Ijma' or the consensus of the Salaf of this Ummah, and is also affirmed by reasoning and uh, by one's natural disposition, his fitrah. As far as the Book and the Sunnah, there are more than 6,000 evidences in the, uh, uh, excuse me, there are more than 1,000 evidences in the Book and the Sunnah which affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. In the Quran alone there are more than 1,000 evidences as some Shafi'i scholars have pointed out. And the Sunnah also is filled with evidences that show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. Among those uh, is verses is, for instance, the verse in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ali Al-Azim. Wa huwa Al-Ali Al-Azim. Al-Ali means the one who possesses Sifat Al-Ulu, this attribute of being above uh, everybody and also possessing all the attributes of perfection. So here in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that one of his names is that he is Al-Ali Al-Azim. Likewise, uh, we find in the Quran among the attributes is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is Al-A'la. Sabbih ism rabbik Al-A'la. Uh, praise the name of your Lord who is Al-A'la, the Most High. And this also means that he possesses the attribute of Al-Ulu or Highness in both respects in the sense that he's above us and also in the respect that he has all the attributes of perfection and he has all the attributes of perfection to the fullest. Uh, also among the attributes are the verses uh, which uh, show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the angels that uh, they fear their Lord who is above them. They fear their Lord who is above them. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is the powerful above his uh, slaves, uh, above his slaves, and this means that he's above them in both senses, that he is perfect, and also in the sense that he has all the attributes, uh, uh, that he's also above them in the sense that he's above the creation. As far as by the Sunnah, we also find uh, in the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ said when the first Kharijis, or Khawaitra, came to him and said, uh, be just, O Muhammad, so Allah Wasallam. The Prophet said, do you not find me trustworthy? And I am trusted by he who is in heaven. By he who is in heaven. 
And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk uh, twice, or do you feel yourself safe from he who is in heaven, even from his punishment? And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described that things rise to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says that the good word rises to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the angels and the spirit, whether the spirit means the soul here or Jibreel, rise to him. Means that he's above us. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said that, that the angels with you rise. Those angels in the evening at Salat al-Asr, they rise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your deeds. And also at Salat al-Fajr, they rise with your deeds to Allah as in the well-known hadith. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that things come down from him. He says that the Qur'an was sent down from him. So this means that he is above us. And the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah comes down during the last third of the night to the heaven uh, which is above uh, this world. So, and many verses in the Qur'an and the Sunnah which confirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us, without doubt. Likewise, the ijma' the consensus of the Sahaba, that they are, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us, cannot be negated. Imam al-Awza'i, from the third generation, after people started to negate that Allah was above mankind, above the creation, and started to claim that Allah was everywhere, Awza'i said, uh, a very well statement, he said, we would say, and the tabi'in, the second generation, were widespread. This is something we learned from them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne. And we believe in whatever is mentioned in the sunnah concerning his attributes. So here Awza'i is telling the people of the third generation. Because Awza'i was the scholar, leading scholar of the Sham, that area of Syria, and the third generation of Muslims. He said, we used to say, and the tabi'un were widespread. Widespread in the second generation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne. And we believe in what is mentioned in the hadith, in the prophet statements concerning Allah's attributes. So we cannot find any of the earlier Muslims saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not above his creation. There is not a single statement which can be quoted upon them. Uh, and therefore, indeed, we find that the Prophet used to uh, point to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like he did in Hujjat al Wada. In his farewell speech, he said to the people, Do you not see that I uh, testify? that I have spread the message to you? And the people said, we do. Testify, you spread to us the clear message. And then the Prophet ﷺ raised his finger and said, Oh Allah, bear witness. Pointing towards that. Bear witness to what they're saying because the Prophet ﷺ will be asked on the day of judgment, did he spread the message? And Allah will question him that. So he's saying, Oh Allah, bear witness. That they have testified that I have spread to them the message so to absolve me from any responsibility. And likewise, when the Prophet ﷺ asked the slave girl, uh, a man hit the slave girl and the Prophet ﷺ told set her free, but first to test if she was a believer, and he said to her, oh, where is Allah? She said, in the heavens, and she pointed up to the sky. Then he said, who am I? And, then, and she said, you are the messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, set her free, she is a believer. So, and likewise, the Prophet ﷺ in his dua, he would raise his hand towards the sky, and also he would raise his eyes towards the sky, and so this all shows that the Prophet ﷺ would understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above his creation, not like the people who believe that Allah is everywhere and so forth. Likewise, we know, so now we've shown that Allah is above us by evidences from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and from the Ijma, the consensus of the earliest Muslims, also by reason. Because we know that if we're to say that Allah is not above us, it means Allah is below us, or to the right of us, or to the left of us, or in front or behind us. And these are all attributes of uh, imperfection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the attributes of perfection. So therefore we believe uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us. So we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us. Uh, likewise, uh, from the fitrah, from the natural disposition which Allah has uh, uh, placed into man, we all realize that when you're praying or you have some sort of need or have some sort of want, your heart raises up and your eyes raise up asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah has endowed this into the creation. Even the Catholics. Go ask any homeless person, where is God? And, or say some, give him something and he'll say thank you. He says, thank God, you'll notice from him, he'll usually look up. Or when people are asking, they usually look up. They don't look right or left or down or somewhere. This is a natural disposition which Allah has placed in the creation. And this is why one time there was a, uh, a great Ash'ari scholar who was known as Imam al-Haramain. 
the Imam of the two Harams, meaning Mecca and Medina, and he's in with Abu Ma'al and Joyni, and he was giving a lecture uh, at one time, and he said um, something which he intended by it to deny that Allah is, uh, you know, in one of their uh, sort of their, their their phrases, which implies that Allah is not above the creation. So one of the uh, people in the audience, was a sheikh also, uh, said his name was Abu Ja'far al-Hamdani. He said, okay, let us not discuss the question of the throne. Because the question of the throne is we only know about this by revelation. I mean, the issue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation is done by the fitrah, by the natural disposition. But the issue of whether that Allah, that Allah is above his throne, the only way we know there was a throne is we know this only by revelation. It's not something by natural, your natural disposition that you know that there's a throne. This is only you know by, by revelation. So Abu Ja'far al-Hamadani said to him, let us not discuss this issue of the throne now. But I want you to respond to me. What is this sense that we feel in our hearts? And he said that uh, there's not a single person who says, Oh Allah, except that he finds his heart by necessity uh, turning towards the heavens. He doesn't find his heart you know, turning right or left. So how can we push this from us? And this is a feeling we find in ourselves. Allah has created us for it. So if, this is, if Allah is not above it, why was this feeling in our hearts? So Abu, uh, Abu Ma'an al-Juwayni, who is an Ash'ari scholar, struck his forehead. And he said that Abu Ja'far al the one who asked this question, has perplexed me. And he didn't know how to answer. Later on, Abu Ma'an al-Juwayni uh, repented from uh, this method and returned to the method of the Salaf concerning and affirmed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation. But the point is, is that he, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us also by our natural disposition. And when this Ash'ari was confronted by his denial for this, how do you push this feeling that we find in our hearts? He couldn't respond. He couldn't respond. So the point is, these five evidences, the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Ijma'ah, the consensus of the Salaf, the reasoning, and the natural disposition which Allah has endowed the creation with, all point to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation. Now, there are two verses in the Qur'an which the Ash'aris try to use to negate that Allah subhanahu